Welcome to a fourth episode. It is Friday, April 10th. It's actually a Feiertag. It's a holiday here in Germany. Um, me, myself, and of course my boss, head coach Sebastian Fonda from the Robinsburg Razorbacks, we have the privilege of having our next guest. Um, in my opinion, and that's what I'm saying in my opinion, he is the best wide receiver in Europe. And we'll get down to why, but when I say the best, it is in terms of him being dynamic at his position. So not only being a receiver, but also being a returner, okay? But we'll get into that aspect. And it is Nathaniel Robitaille from the Shrevish Hall Unicorns. Welcome, Nathaniel. Hey, thank you guys for having me on this Pro Football Europe talk. Definitely. And one thing, of course, right now, viewers can't see us right now, but yeah. when we release little, little snippets and clips, they're going to see that. Basically, Nathaniel, what he did for this interview, he went out and bought himself a microphone and <laughs> headsets to get prepared. He is that committed to the game. So talk yeah. about preparation. But anyhow, he is a guy going into his uh, fifth year here in Europe. Actually, it's the fourth season coming up with the Unicorns. Prior to that, he was with the Frankfurt Universe. Um, I had the privilege of coaching him in 2017. Essentially, that is the lone season when he had 20 or more touchdowns, I'm just saying. You know, it's a common denominator. No, I, I, I think I had 20 last year, right? No, you didn't. You had 18. You checked it? I think so. I got to look back at it right now, but it's 18. Uh, damn, I got I to get out. You better than that. Yeah, but better um, you're a guy that came out of Stonehill back in, where exactly is it? Uh, Eastern Massachusetts, about 30 minutes outside of Boston. So basically, you, you, you just went to go play down the street, right? Yeah, essentially. I mean, the recruiting process was a little different. I didn't, uh, I didn't do... I didn't take as many visits as we should have, and we were asked to, but me and my family were kind of just caught up in the, uh, I guess, the whole I'm getting recruited type thing more than, all right, this is what you do during the recruiting process. So we didn't really get out away from New England to, and there was a bunch of schools that wanted me to travel and uh, go see them, but we just, I don't know, we just got caught up in different stuff. Interesting. Hindsight's, hindsight's 2020. I wish I could have did that, but, I mean, hey, I'm here now, so let's be okay. Because, like, one interesting factor is, I mean, in high school, what did you play? Yeah, that was the thing, too, that was kind of – I was only a quarterback. I was a quarterback in a DB, so okay. being a quarterback the whole time, they didn't really have much film on me doing um, what I'm doing now. All they had me was throwing and running and uh, basically playing deep third. <laughs> so what So what did teams want you to do? So, I mean, the teams that recruited you out of high school since you played quarterback, I mean, what, what were they talking about? They were saying more of what? Yeah, so the D3s were all saying, well, the D3s saying I could have been a dual sport. They said uh, you could come here and play basketball and football if you really wanted to. And then as the levels went up, D2, Division One, AA, D1, they said, yeah, you're just going to be seen as an athlete when you come in here. We're not going to – you're too small to be a quarterback. I was six feet, 170, maybe 165. But so all that kind of culminated into me going and playing receiver at Stonehill which they told me at first, I can come in and play whatever I want. I could try out whatever I wanted. But the first day of camp, my locker was number 86. So I was like, ah. Really? I'm not. <laughs> yeah. And they'll, they'll tell you this day, they still tell everybody, all the recruits when they come in, um, they have like a private workout before each thing, like before each, uh, what is it, visit, your overnight visit. And they have a workout. And I dropped every single pass. Literally every single pass. Yeah. I dropped every single pass. Why was that? Yeah. Why would you say? I was a quarterback, man. So you, you basically couldn't catch? I couldn't catch. <laughs> no, I could catch. I'm an athlete now. I could do it now. I could do it now. <laughs> You're like, whoa, whoa, whoa time out. Time out. <laughs> but yeah, they'll tell you that story. Do you attribute that to the gloves then? Like, is this something going on? Or with like key tape, for example? Would you uh, repeat that? What would you say? That was a joke, actually. I oh, said, yeah, I I said, I said, you said you, it too fast. I said, would you attribute this to wearing gloves, or is that like a king tape type of deal? Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, but okay. I mean, how, how was Stonehill? Because from what I know, the time when you were there, for example, Nate Morris, who is now – should be with the Cologne Crocodiles last year, played with Terriel at, uh, at Hildesheim. Part of that, he was where? Also at Trebish Hall, also at Frankfurt. I mean, you play with a, with a dominant guy like him. You play with um, Sterry, who played at English shot, is now at Straubing. And from what you were telling me, like, you guys had a legit squad. You had dogs. Yeah, I mean, from 2011, 2015, we had the 
I think we were the most winningest class in all throughout Stonehill history. So, I mean, uh, we actually, we got a part share of the conference championship in 2013. And we, had, we just had, from 2000, I would say, 12 after we played on national TV on CBS on, it's kind of when Stonehill took a turn. But before, they were always 500. And then my sophomore year, after we played on TV against the number three team in the country, um, that's when we kind of turned it up after that and just kind of. But Stonehill will always be, to be honest, I think they'll always be a 500 team because it's just a, it's one of those schools where you have to have the academic part to come with it too. So, I mean. Meaning, what do you mean? Like guys have issues with like grades and trying to get in and stuff like that? Like, yeah, well, you know, you, know how, you know how some schools, they, it's just like it's a real high academic school. Okay. Yeah, they, they call it a little Ivy. So, I mean, it's real tough to get in. So, so you know, you, you'll get some ballers in there, but as far as all over the field, maybe, maybe not. Okay. So, but I mean, they do good. They do, uh, except for when they got piped 73 to zero or something like that. Was this when you were there or was that? Oh, heck no, not for me. This is after. I, I never would. If I'm on a team, we never get a fight like that. I suppose that your, your, your junior and senior year, you had, what, a record-breaking, right? Like, in what, like, it was multiple categories from what I've read. Yeah, my uh, my junior year, I broke every single season record. Um, and then my senior year, I broke all the school records. Okay. When they did, they just got broke from a uh, uh, young cat named Andrew Jamil. Real solid. He, I think if he doesn't, uh, if the NFL stuff don't work out, I think he'll be a real good uh, European player if he takes this route. He'll probably be the next Roby or what? Or, you, or you're still better? I mean, I work hard, so I'm always going to say I'm, I'm the best. <laughs> hey, you, you bring up an interesting thing. You say you've come from high school to college, be a quarterback mindset, and now the coaches move you to right receiver, which happened in Hero with a lot of kids. They're coming to practice and say, hey, I'm a defense end. And you're like, no, you are not. And how was your mindset? Because now you say one year later, you break all records on the new position, right receiver. How was your opinion? You was like, well, fuck the coaches. Or you say like, damn, I'm, I take the challenge and I, I go up to it. Well, it was kind of like playing receiver, I think. I mean, a quarterback helped out a lot because I was a quarterback from when I started playing until my senior year of high school. And then when I went to college, it was almost like I didn't know how to play football. I was really, it was like a, a little bit of a dark time. I didn't want to play because I wasn't playing. So you come from being the quarterback and the guy that everyone looks at and getting recruited by everybody. And then you go to school. It's after all the, hey, we love you, we want you here. Then it's the real, the real grind. And I didn't play a lot my freshman year. Um, it was a special teams. I played uh, some snaps here and there, but it wasn't what I was used to. And then, but for me, it was just a, a learning process. And I love the game. So for me to sit down and watch the guys above me and watch guys on YouTube, like that's a big, I tell guys that if you want to play a different position or you get thrust into a different position, watch guys that have played at a higher level in that position and just take different things and put them into your game. But I was fortunate enough to have three coaches who all now coach at very high levels, two in FCS and one uh, who's with a CFL team and in, in the XFL. They're uh, my all four years there. I had those guys, so I got coached by a lot of great uh, receiver coaches, which was good for me. That's great because I think that's what always. That's why we're doing this to share the history of how you become from high school player to uh, the number one right receiver on Hero. And I was also expecting, like, well, he should be play for ever right receiver. And now yeah. he, was, he was a quarterback before. Yeah. Very, very interesting. I think the guys out there appreciate it. They're, they're very this process. Yeah, it's still, it's definitely still a work in process. I learn new stuff every day. I mean, I'll sit there and watch different guys on YouTube and stuff, to your point. And, I mean, I just learn new, little nuances and little tips and tricks. I mean, because as you get older, Guys are getting more experienced and more film is getting watched. So you have to have that. Athleticism can take over for some of the game. But then once you get down to the dog grind of the game, you got to have the little little intricacies of the game to be everybody. So, And that's, that's something I've noticed, especially since knowing you since 2017. I mean, we did meet 2016 when you were in Frankfurt and I was at um, an Algoy. Yeah. Um, but what I've noticed, and especially the last few years, is kind of more – 
nothing against your game. You are one of the most athletic guys out there. It's more of the, the mental aspect of it. That's what I noticed with you. You, you have that, that attention to detail. You put in the work. You treat it like a true job. What, to be honest, is the thing, right? As an import, when they bring you out here, um, it is a job. Like, we're not taking any breaks. You still essentially want to find a way and do what you did to a certain level and actually even more than, let's say, in college. And it is hard to find and see a lot of imports doing essentially what you're doing where you take it as a job. You are preparing the right way. You are putting the work. And the other aspect is you have that dog mentality. Like, you literally, you walk it and you talk it. Yeah, I don't, I just, that's just kind of been something I've been ingrained with because being from, being from a, I was always kind of that thrust in the spotlight from when I started playing sports. I was always seen as, the, oh, he's faster than everybody. He's a little taller than everybody. So I always had to take that leadership role, which kind of helped me out to this day. But yeah, I mean, coming to Europe, it's different because you, like you said, it's a job. But when you first get out here, you're like starstruck, especially if you haven't been to Europe or traveled a lot. So you're like, damn, all this is new. This is different. So you want to take it all in. But then you got to remember, hey, I got practice this day, this day, and this day, and then I got to play on Saturday. And if I don't perform, I can get sent home. That's a possibility. Would, would you say coming from a school like Stonehill and not going, let's say, to a big school like D1 kind of helped you in that process? I mean, I think it's – I think that's – I hear that all the time. Guys talk about, hey, we, we don't get D1 guys because they're pampered and this and that. But I think that's all truly on the self, on how you are as a person. I think if you got a guy that played Division One, he came out here and he had the same mentality as, as a, as a, I would say me, just going to get it every day, knowing what you got to do every day to succeed and be the best, he'll be fine. And I think if you got a guy that played Division Three or NIAI, and they do the same thing, it's just I think it's all about the person, not the different divisions you come from. Absolutely, you know, you need to want. And how was like now you say? Sometimes it's also the little things to say the first time to Europe and you're in one of the biggest cities in Germany, in Frankfurt. How was this then straight yeah. preparing, stepping out of the airplane, the big city life, high expectation at the universe? How did oh. it all come together in your first first year? I, Frankfurt is awesome. That's, that was my home away from home, for real. So I, I love everything about the Frankfurt uh, universe and organization and what they did for me then. And uh, the first thing that happened when I got off the plane, well, one, I met my boy Benji. That's my guy. Shout out to Benji. Um, but we were pulling into the, what was it, the offices, and there's a dude just sitting there with his pants halfway down, peeing on the sidewalk. And they said, <laughs> they said yeah, for real. It's really happening. They said, welcome to Europe. I was like, oh, crap. it's going to be a little different. <laughs> it's going to be a little different. <laughs> But I will say one thing, though, with, like, being in Europe, you don't see that much of, uh, I want to say, like, homelessness or people like that out, out in Europe. You don't see that much, like, as you do back more in the States and bigger cities like that. So I thought that was a pretty cool thing. And just the quality of life out here, I think, is way better than back home. Back home is a rat race. And out here is just, uh, I mean, people enjoy their lives. That's what I've seen the most. That's great. And you expect something like, I mean, you're coming straight into the universe fan base. You expect something like that, like home games with football, American football fans. There are no it's or down. We should get loud. Our defense is on the field. So, well, the whole, that, that, to, that, to that question, the whole time it's loud. With those little noisemakers and smacking and clapping and all that stuff. All that is loud the entire game. But, I mean, for the universe, that's the big thing they pride is their fan base. And I really didn't understand it until we had our first game there. And I was like, wow, they really do enjoy, like, being here and, and watching the game and meeting you and high-fiving after the game and stuff like that. So it was a cool thing for me to see from the little power parties we had where they had, like, all the people there before the game, kind of like a tailgate, to the stadium getting packed. So, I mean, it was, it was a cool experience for me, for my first experience to be out in Europe and that be my, my first – glimpse of what it is about European football. And I mean, you, you had a, to be honest, you had a hell of an introduction because, I mean, nothing against other programs, but you, you went to a program that did it well, you know, from, from preparation, practices, approaching it from a professional standpoint. Yes, it is a semi-pro deal, but for you guys, they, 
they basically set it up in a platform like, hey, this is a job. You got to come in, clock in, clock out. So you did have at least kind of, let's say, a little bit of that structure that you used to in the States and that transition then in some sort of professional manner. Um, talk about that situation that you had going in there because from what I know and that you mentioned to me too as well, just talking is like you were brought in as a third offensive um, import, right? Yeah, I didn't um... – yeah, because I was still going through all, like, the NFL, CFL stuff back home in 2015 and 16. And then Nate Morris actually is the one that said, hey, I'm going to this new team this year. Um, we got a lot of good guys. This should be a good thing. And I told him, hey, if I don't get anything uh, from – I don't hear anything back from these coaches over here in the States, I'll give it a shot. And then uh, one day he hit me up. I, then I was like, yeah, hey, let me talk to the coach real quick. Got in contact with Gron that next – day Brown and, Co and coach K my guy the next day and then I was on a flight two weeks later <laughs> it was just a quick turnaround like literally so fast it was so fast for me so how, how was it dealing with because this is the thing right you're a guy that essentially you've already dealt with adversity going in let's say your first two years at Stonehill new position having to find a way to become successful right and now you end up flying overseas and you end up being a guy who has to sit on the bench. Horrible. For the most part. Horrible. Horrible. It was horrible. Horrible. I'm not like that. It was like freshman year of college all over again. It was okay. horrible. How would you take that, though? Like, was there, was there moments where you came in and you were like, fuck, this is bullshit, like, complaining? Or was it more like, all right, this is a challenge, and I'm going to do whatever I can and take advantage of these two, three, maybe five reps that I get? I think it was a lot of prayer, a lot of patience. And a lot of um, that, just being me, just being the guy that comes to practice every day, working hard, and uh, just showing the coaches, hey, if you guys need a big play, I'm right here. And you, you don't got to worry about, uh, like, trying to finagle stuff in and out with us three. You know Marcus was just going to play because he was the quarterback. Mm -hmm. It was just me and Jesse. So, But and it was tough because you bring two – you have three A's, and one's a running back and one's a receiver. I mean – when a running back's in, what's he going to do? Run the ball. Right. The receiver's in, what's he going to pass the ball? Kind of gave it away, which I think kind of kind of bit us in the ass um, sometimes during the season. But, I mean, for me, it was just a – it was a growing-up period for sure, being in Europe by myself for the first time, new language, new, new city, new culture, everything. And then the same thing again, like you said, being that third import, I mean, it was just a lot of, like I said, patience and just going to work every day like a professional, how a professional should. I know some guys would kind of be like, ah, fuck this. I need to go home. Like, this is not what I came here for. But and for me, not only imports. Yeah. Not, not only imports, but also like Germans. Yeah. Or not, sorry. Oh, not, yeah. in, in our instance, in the GFL, a lot more Germans, right? Domestic guys, just in general. Yeah. I don't understand, like, this is about taking advantage of your opportunities that you get. Actually, Tom Brady – had, what, a podcast two days ago or yesterday on Howard Stern, and he even talked about it. He said he was never the guy, and even, he even talks to the young guys that come in, he was never a guy, in the beginning, he would get, like, three reps at practice or five reps. Yeah. And literally, it's what we say as coaches. I always tell my guys, too, I say, you make the best of those three reps, of those three reps you get, even if they're on scout team. Mm -hmm. We're calling it in the way we call it in our system, right? We're going exactly. to notice if you're playing well. And then those three reps will become maybe, what, five seven but guys don't get it. like oh, i want more reps well it's like fuck exactly. take advantage of your three reps bust your ass i'm gonna see it on tape and i'm gonna throw you in you know it's, it's, it's like point. for you for you real quick yeah. when you were at frankfurt essentially numbers wise average per catch you had 25 yards a catch more than you've ever had everywhere else right so essentially essentially what was it 40 percent of your touches were touchdowns nine touchdowns yeah. But you did take advantage of your reps, and you were an A getting paid. In the most part, if it was somebody else, a domestic guy, he would have quit already. Oh, yeah, for sure. Or he would have got said, hey, you're not doing enough. you could kind of be out of here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I feel, but like I, tell, um, like I tell guys here at Hall, too, because we bring in a, a ton of receivers the past couple of years, and I tell them, hey, don't, don't start getting down now in the preseason and the early season because it's a long season, one. And two, guys always get nicked and banged up because it's just a long season. It's grueling sometimes. And guys, they don't – I don't know if they take heed of that, inf like, information and, like, still work it out because it ha it's happened every year I've been here. 
somebody goes down and then you got to step up. Mm-hmm. And, you, and, you know, as a coach, I know Coach Newman and I know for the rest of the league, they're not messing around. If you're not in there performing during the game, you're not going to play. So that's just – you got to – what you said is true. You got to be ready at all times. So that's what – back to that point about being a third and four, I was just ready at all times. Yeah, because, I mean, that was one of the biggest things, and you know me, and that's one of the things I preach is like – and it, and it goes in the whole aspect of it being semi-pro and being an import and, and trying to deal with both sides of the coin. It's like people got to understand, right? We as imports, players and coaches, we get paid to win games. Yeah, that's your livelihood. <laughs> you get paid for production. Yeah. I got a guy who's not doing his job, and I really don't care if it's an import or if it's a domestic player. I got to make a decision because yeah. this is the thing, right? Yeah, we're talking about playing time and trying to do whatever we can do. Also, it depends where we're at and what division, of course, you know. But if I have you in too long, we fuck up, we lose. That was That's now me having to answer to the board, what the fuck. Yeah, it so happens so. everywhere. It either happens, why didn't you give him more playing time? Or it happens, oh, why did you give him if you knew he's fucking up? And it's like, you know what? I'd rather take the way that I know where it's like, I'm going to control the outcome of this game as much as I can. Yeah, no, I, I definitely hear that wholeheartedly. I feel that everything you said right there. That's true because, it, like, it's it's your livelihood. You don't want to – you lose games, hey, you out the door. <laughs> but yeah. if you, you, win, you win games, you get to put that – you put to get to put that on your resume. You get to put those guys that help you out on your resume. So, I mean, I definitely feel you on that. Um, talking about your situation in Frankfurt, because then, I mean, we came into a situation together where 2017 was for both of us, our first season in Schwabish Hall, you know, and I know for me, why I ended up going there, it was to continue to, to get better as a coach, to keep learning, to also learn from Jordan Newman, um, because I knew essentially what the program Schwabish Hall represented and at least having an opportunity to say, you know what, we want you here to coach for us, you know, I, I would have been stupid to say no. Talking to you in your aspect, you could have – I mean, I don't know what the situation was at the time at Frankfurt. If they wanted you back, um, did they want you to stay? Or what was kind of the situation that – No, so in, Frank- uniform? Yes. so in Frankfurt, I was hurt. I tore my hamstring twice in the beginning of the season. So it was kind of like, uh, what is this? This guy doesn't really – we ha- haven't really seen him play much except for the second half of the season. So you add that factor in with – the three import rule that we had was three and so I was like, man, did we bring him back, da 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 And so Coach K actually hit me up and said, hey, uh, we're going to go a different way. I said, hey, that's fine. Thank you for everything. Thank you for the opportunity. Coach Newman actually uh, contacted me, and then, I mean, the rest is kind of history from that. But, um, yeah, I say I tell guys all the time because – I'm sure you, you as coaches, guys hit you up all the time about, hey, coach, let me play, let me get on, let me get how, how do I get to Europe? And I tell them, for me, I had the best of both worlds. I came in with a team that had the most money, most fans, this and that, da 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 to one of the, if not arguably the best team in Europe. So for me, my path is going to be way different than a guy that's just saying, hey, how do I get on? And you're going to have to go play in Spain for maybe a year Mm -hmm. and then go play in Finland for two years or something just to get your name in the circuit. So I've been blessed to be at the top of this whole European circuit for the last five years. So that's why I tell guys, you got to just get your name in before you can kind of do the pictures and stuff that you see from everybody yeah. that you, we post and stuff. It's not all, that's not what it is. You got to work for that. Sure. Absolutely. And how was the different then coming from Frankfurt, 2 million people city, 1 million people city to Schwäbisch Hall? How was the, <laughs> How, how was that? I mean, of course, besides football, you know, you're a young man, you want to do something. I mean, it, was it also different than being in a, in a very, very small town to do something off the practice or off the, off the gym? How was your, your, your day looking then? And the, and the pay cut. You took a pay cut. I took a half a pay cut on that one. All right. <laughs> I took a half pay cut on that one. Wait, uh... The um, to your question, what what is there to do in, inside a hall but play football, work out, and eat? Exactly. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful little town. You can walk around for 
five minutes to see the whole city. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> five minutes. <laughs> but I mean, hey, I, I, if I didn't, if I didn't, if I don't love something, I don't do it. That's just how I am. So, I love football. I love Europe, Swabish Hall. I'm back again because I just I like being here. Yeah. It's, a, it's a cool place to be. The people are awesome. The relationships that I built. I can walk down the city now. And I know everybody in all the shops. I can get free. I can, you, you two can come down. We can get a free ice cream and a meal if you really want. <laughs> yeah, that's what I, that's what I would, the, the question was go to. You come from, from Frankfurt. There is the universe big, but nobody cares because it's a huge city. You know, you have soccer teams and everything. And in Schwäbisch Hall, uh, the unicorns are the real deal. The unicorns the only show in town. Yeah, so that's one aspect that I like about it is that everybody comes to the games. It's almost like a high school atmosphere, like a big high school where everybody shows up and everybody comes and supports. And the atmosphere on game day out here is crazy. I mean, it's yeah. only 2,500 people, maybe max, maybe three if we get a, a, a good matchup in town. But everybody comes and everybody supports you. And the kids, the kids love you. I, I, I'm a big, I don't know, I'm a big kid myself, so I like being around the kids and showing love to the kids that come to the game and stuff. So it's just a, a great atmosphere if you want to come. If you want to come catch a European football game, Swabish Hall probably, probably one of the one of the best towns to see how it is because it's not you're not going to get the big glitz and glamour of playing at the Division One FBS game, but you're going to see what playing in Europe is all about. I mean, and and, and it reminds you of, let's say. I look at it, it reminds you kind of more back like your high school days, type Friday Night Lights where everybody's in town, you know what I'm saying? Like me, me being in a hall kind of seeing like, literally like I walk into town on game day after I go to the gym that morning, I'd hit up the Reve and people in line at the Reve would be asking me like, how does the game look today? People I had never met before. Yeah. And I remember the first time it shocked me, I remember looking back, I was like, what? You it's know, crazy. I was like, oh, okay. Like that's one of the, and then I got used to it, but it's, it's interesting where, like, literally, or you'd see people walking in town on game day with unicorn shirts on. Kind of like yesterday with our show, we're talking about the receiver, like, in Prague, where the Black Panthers, like, their fan base is essentially the same, like, like Swift Hall. And even thinking about it, I'm like, it's, it's interesting when you see people at the games and they're all rocking what? Unicorn gear. Oh, I you can't see that hey, anywhere else. Go back and watch the, uh, the German Bowl this year when they pan to the crowd. Yeah. All those people wearing unicorns gear. I didn't even know there was that many people that would, that really mess with wow. me like that. It's crazy. Yeah. It's really crazy. Yeah. How, how's your experience now you bring it up to point three? You, you played in three German balls already in five years. Uh, my experience, what you mean? What you mean experience in? I mean, in like, I mean, this is the biggest final in hero. Oh yeah. Oh, oh the, in the, you're in the German bowl. Yeah. Um, I mean, to me, it's just a, I don't know, like, I, even after, like, of course, you love being there because you want to strive to be the best for everything. But for me, I can look back on those games and it's just another game, to be honest. That cool? Yeah, for me, I don't, I don't get too, like, get too high, get too low, get too crazy, get too crunk. I do get crunk sometimes. I'm not going to hold you. I get crunk. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's just another game. Okay. It's, I mean, that, because this year was... 20,000 visitors. Yeah. Sunday was a packed full stadium. Yeah. And um, yeah, how you feel is football growing? Is it helps you also? Oh, immensely. In, in Europe, immensely. Football is growing. It would, be, it would be cool to start something here where you kind of, you help out. I think that, like you guys are doing, it would be cool to have like an end game here where you played in the league and then you kind of stuck around for however long you wanted to and help the game take that next step forward. Because just to see like all the teams, like when you go to the German Bowl and you see all the teams that go and they wear their jerseys and stuff to the game and it's just watching and supporting. And it's just a, it's a cool, it's a cool thing to see that there's so much love for the game that I love in a whole other country, a part of the world that you never thought it would be. So I, I think, think you see it more. And I, I can be honest, I think you see it more when you play, let's say, those big games, those critical games, and then once you roll into playoffs, that's where you see kind of the magnitude of it, of how, how big it is, especially like, I mean, for me, what impressed me, 
and kind of took me aback a little was 2017 when we played in the German Bowl and the amount of people that watched it on Eurosport, people writing me after the game when we won the German Bowl, even back in the States, people were watching on live TV and the amount of people there. Like, that's what took me aback when I was like, you know, like, and don't get me wrong, like, you do have those games where maybe there's 1,500 people, you know, so it's not a lot. But once you make that jump to playoffs, you realize, like, it's a little bit – I'm not going to say pressure, but now you see kind of that level escalate, you know, and it's, it's very interesting. I mean, especially, like – and, I, and actually, um, I was showing Coach Sebastian the, the highlights of the German Bowl, um, that little one-hour clip that GFL TV had on it uh, for 2017, and it's like it brings back memories of how loud it was, you know, it was freezing balls, it was fucking rainy, People you know. Crying. Fans crying. Yeah. You, you guys, the receivers, was it? Um, Aria Big Days on and Mark fucking threw two cold ass buckets on me and shit. Oh, yeah. One, I was pissed off. My phone's in my pocket. <laughs> you know, and I was like, appreciate you guys making matters worse. But no, like, it's, it's that situation we see, like, where it's like, I, I don't think we really see it. It's more like when we talk to other people, you know, that's where now you kind of see how big it is. Yeah. For, for real, you don't. I mean, I've I've seen it just because playing in Frankfurt, when we played some teams, it was five six thousand people at it. We played Hall that one year at the end of the season. It was seven, seven, yeah, wow. close to eight. That was wild. And then in Hall, you go to a small stadium, and they say, "Oh, the capacity." You hear the capacity is only like twenty two to twenty four, maybe. And then you check the, you hear from other people, "Hey, we just had three thousand at this game." Yeah. Like, sheesh, that gets growing. And then even from the German Bowl, our first year in 2017 was, what, 15 in the pouring rain, cold sleet. Like, it was disgusting. Mm-hmm. People still came and showed out. Mm-hmm. And then the year following, it went up to 18. And then the year after that, it was 20. So I think it's going to keep growing and growing and growing. This as long, just as long as it's a good product. As long as it's a good product on the field, it'll keep growing and growing and growing. Okay. Um, what would you how, – how, how would you, let's say – how would you talk about your experience playing with another guy also? Because you also have another really good receiver there and also a really good friend, um, Tyler Rutenbeck. Because it's a thing where, and I talk about it all the time, and nothing against him, you guys are a dynamic duo. Yeah, you know, for both sure. of you guys basically complement each other because, for example, 2017, and I'm just going to say it, was the only year both of you guys had over 1,000 yards catching. And respectively, both of you guys had over 20 yard, or sorry, 20 touchdowns. You know, and kind of going about that aspect of it, it's like that also helps you what? Raise your level of play, right? Because that year was your most explosive year to this point, just number-wise all over. Yeah, for sure. That's my guy, Rudy. Um, Don't call him Tyler because that's his government name, and he don't like to be called Tyler. (laughs) So that's my guy, Rudy. Government show. Yeah, that's like uh, that's left and right. Uh, Bam, bam. That's It's just we just – Every day you got to raise your level of play because you know it's you got a guy on the other side that wants to win just as much as you. And just having him on one side knows like, hey, I if I don't show out, he he gonna have to take the brunt of everything. Mm-hmm. And he's just vice versa. If he if he don't show out, I'm gonna have to take the brunt of everything. And just being that we we really never ever I don't think we've ever really talked about being the two best receivers in Europe, tandem in Europe, it's just something that we do. I don't think it's ever been, and it's never been a thing where, I don't think ever in our entirety has it been like, oh, uh, he's getting too many balls. He's doing this too much. Oh, like, kind of going. We literally just work together. We just play. We're on the same receiving court, the same team. It just so happens that we maybe probably are the best receivers in Europe (laughs) I mean best deep threat um definitely probably Rudy he goes up and gets that mug he just he's fast fast I remember I tried to race not race he didn't know I was racing him but we were we was doing sprints uh or across the field I tried to take off and he just go float it I was like damn this dude fast but he just man it's a it's a beautiful thing to have I know he had that prior with Pat having just two – I think that's our, the unicorn system, just getting two really good wide receivers and just having – because that's tough on European defenses. 
especially if you bring over one import. So you, what are you going to do? You're going to put one guy over Rudy and then leave the other guy with a European? He's going to eat up all day. Exactly. So you see, now, and now you see the league, the Frankfurts, the Dresdens, the teams that we always end up playing with time to time counts. Well, every game counts, but when it gets to like that, it's part of the season. Right. All those guys went out and got like Division One or high level defensive backs, or they go out and get high level European defensive backs. So people, t- I mean, we, we don't have to say it because we already know and we see it from other teams. People take notice that. To to kind of go through us on offense, you you got to stop, you got to stop one of us, you got to stop both of us. I mean, it's, so. it's essentially it's essentially going off of what the let's say the template or the game plan that Jordan had back in 2017, where it was like, and kind of talk about that aspect is like first of all his his focus was we need to load up the defense to stop who, New Yorker, yeah, because we were preparing to beat New Yorker, right? You know, and it's kind of going off of that same deal where now, okay, you see what Hall's offense has, what makes them dynamic, and it's like, well, fuck, if we don't have a top-level DB or at least a legit group of DBs, we can't stop them, plain and simple, you know? No way. It's just the way it is. You know, the other deal is, and it's very interesting, we're talking about this, and I don't know if you remember this, one of the things that kind of, and it talks about also about the strip hall structure and how everything is set up to kind of, push you guys to excel at a high level and perform at a high level because it is ran like a collegiate practice. It's like there is no downtime. Like what, what, what we were doing there and you guys 100% still do, um, it is high paced. Reps are an emphasis. It is essentially take advantage of the reps you are given and we're on to the fucking next one because the, the big simulation is what? It's like a game. We want to make it worse than a game. So when you do have that high stress situation like we had in the journal 2017, shit, we're fucking cool. It was actually New Yorker that was freaking the fuck out in that in those final minutes, you know. Yeah. But the other deal was, and it still takes me back, and I talk about it every team I've been on, where everybody 2017 from day one, what did they say? Even some of our guys on our team, what did they say? New Yorker's gonna win. Hall has no chance. Yeah, and even there was, there was fan, there was fans saying, there was fans saying that. Huh? Oh, there was fans talking about that. Yeah. You guys having a good season, this and that, da 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 da. But when it comes down to New Yorker, they, I think they're gonna take it. I said what? No, you, it was the time New Yorker coming from four German balls in rows, three hero balls in wall in row. It was like really like I was watching this game too, and I was like. Oh, that will be a long day for Schwäbisch Tal. And then you start to block the PATs and block the field goals. And I was like, now you take advantage of your chances. And you did it. And, and, and everything works out. And it was, that was one of the, the, the best games because we all remember the field goal, three seconds to go, 20-yard line. And uh, you did have come in there and ball. blast that thing backwards. Yeah, it was it was it was a it was a it was a it was a great, great. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie. I every time I see that clip, I get a little teary eyed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I I still remember what was going through my head. I literally was like, God, it's in your hand. If you want, I literally said, I said, if you want it to happen, I, I remember standing there and I was like, if you want it to happen, it's up to you. If not, I accept it. Yeah, I was just it on the sideline. Yeah, and was... the second the second Devin blocked it, it was like, holy shit. We just won, you know. Yeah. It's still it like a weight just lifted. Yeah. Even like for me, like, and I tell everybody, I don't, and it still hasn't really set in, like, that whole experience. Like, it's, like, it was kind of more like, like, we kind of talk about, right? It was kind of more, it was like, it's just normal. It was part of the process. Yeah, for real. So it doesn't feel like it was like, oh, like, such a, it was more like we knew what we had to do. We clocked, and especially with the receivers, my kind of big thing, and I brought up a few times, especially that deal where it was kind of like, Let's just do our fucking job. Let's not buy into this bullshit, to the noise. You know, as long as we show up, we do our fucking job, we're fucking fine. You know, and I kind of see that kind of looking back, look, looking at back or looking at it back now, it's like essentially everybody knew their role. We got the fucking job done. We did what we had to do, you know, and essentially that's what made us successful because, you know, it was like little check marks, boom, 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 you know? Yeah, I mean, I... I don't, I don't think Coach Newman remembers this, but we went three and out the first drive. And I came off the field and I said, we're going to win this game. They're not ready. You got hurt too. Man, we don't want to talk about that. Remember you got hurt? Yeah, we don't want to talk about that. I remember that. going to halftime. <laughs> like, we're both sitting there. We're like, fuck. 
Because he took a shot and fumbled it. Yeah, we don't we don't want to talk about that. We hey, remember, talk about the way. I'm, I'm gonna adversity. Remember, Overcome remember adversity. Berlin Rebels. Remember Berlin Rebels quarterfinals? What you did to me? What happened? You tell me what happened. Okay, so it was fourth and one. What was it fourth quarter or it was, it, was, quarter, right? it was fourth and one on the probably the, like the fifteen, and I had to run a pivot route. And this is to basically win the game. Okay, I had to run a pivot route. I had one-on-one -on -one coverage. The guy was inside leverage, and he was about maybe six yards off. I said, I'm about to get a touchdown right here because he don't even know what's happening. <laughs> so I'm about to win the game, get a touchdown, game over. But my dumb ass didn't run the route. I cut it short. I took two, like, two less steps than I should have. And when I came out, the ball was on me, and I dropped it. And it was my – and they took the ball over. I think they, they went down and scored, right? Went down and scored. They had to, yeah. They went down and scored, and then we went to overtime. But, yeah, I remember that play specifically because it could have sealed the game, and I dropped it. And I know it was my fault. I, I rushed the route. I, I wasn't patient. I got into it too fast. I know because if, if I really hit the slant, if I went three up and three in and came back out, he would have been on the slant, and it would have been to the end zone. Because Ari was taking his guy deep, I would have been to the end zone. Yeah, for, for receivers out there, run your fucking routes. That is yeah, like patience. Annoying. Patience but is a virtue. It, you made up for an overtime, you know, and I remember no, you – No, 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 no. No, it wasn't a, huh? no, we were down. We were down. We were down, and we were at the 50. It was fourth and 10. Sure. And, Cole, yep, we were down because it was like a minute left or something. Because remember, Tim had to kick the field goal to make us go in overtime. Right. So we were driving. And fourth and 10 came at the 50. Coach Newman said, all right, we're going to run uh, whatever. Everybody go deep. Everybody run an under. Ran an under, caught that thing at like maybe two yards past the line of scrimmage. Got around the edge. I said, oh, there's nobody there. One guy came, shucked him to the side, kept my balance, got the first down. If I, if I tripped up at all, man, a different story, 2017. Yeah. And that would have been all my fault. It was, Damn it. <laughs> it was an awful, Damn it. <laughs> the whole second half, and that was also another rainy game. You know, oh, horrible. Really horrible that. rain. Hey, I, I had to hold my pee because I had a pee, and I'm sitting in the whole second half like, fuck, man. You, you just know? peed your pants, man. Huh? You just peed your pants. I'm doing what you do all the time. <laughs> no, Not cool unless pants. you pee your pants. No, but what I'm talking about is after the game, I remember you came up to me and we talked for a little bit, and you're like, hey, what did you think when I dropped that? And I was just like, I was going to kill you. <laughs> like, hey, but I made up for it, right? I still remember that moment. But you see, <laughs> I, that's, my, that's just my life. Light, I'm lighthearted. I'm a happy-go-lucky guy. I just love life. Yeah. But even, even in the biggest moment where that's going on, like you just said, that's, people always bring up stories of me like that. Like, damn, why he's so goofy? Why he's so, like, like he just, that's me. I'm just calm. I'm just, I've been there. I've done it. I've been in those situations. So me just to make light of something like that that was so big for everybody around me right I don't know, that's just how i live but yeah that was 2017 was a ride i mean because we because hey sorry to cut you we grinded for that yeah people don't understand 2017 was a grind I, of course we had some games where we bought, like busted people up and then there was some games like english style where it was like how are they scoring all these you points? With the, with the six, seven trick plays on our defense? Yeah. I'm like, how, how are we not beating the crap out of these guys? It made no sense. Yeah. I'm like, I can't – I am not going to cuss. We yeah. talked, huh? we, we talked uh, late uh, – early in the week with him, with Frank Rosa. He's like, yeah, there's no way we beat Hall normally. So, they picked up eight, seven, eight trick plays. 90% <laughs> worked out, which is shocking. I still remember me and me and Coach Zella were up in the coach's box because I was normally up in the coach's box, and we were so pissed off, like motherfucking screaming, throwing shit, which is normal for all season. But like the people next to us and the next box over, which is the TV crew and all that, they're kind of sitting there like, "What the fuck?" They're, they're terrified of us, and we, especially that game, we were like heated, heated. You know, but no, like we did, we grind for it because this is the thing, like, and we already talked about it a little bit. It's like everybody did their job. Like you had, you know, Mark Schoenberg coming down from what? From um, Cologne area. Yep. There he was coming down from, you know, you had all these guys coming in, putting in the work. I mean, I was at the time I was living in Munich 
And I talk about a few times, it's like, I was tired from work. You yeah, know, even like, you, like, even you were grinding back and forth. But you got it was you guys that that made it worth it. Those four and a half, five hour train rides to get there, you know, and then boom, I was away. It wasn't the energy drinks; it was you guys actually. <laughs> right. The second we hit the field, it was what? It was business, right? Yeah, the whole time. Once that whistle blew, we, we had fun with each other, and especially me and you, we kind of have the same personality. We joke around, we fuck around, but it was business, you know. And it's like you notice, like everybody had fun, even coaches. Me and Coach Zeller, Coach Bauer, the DP coach, would talk shit. You know, the old line coach, for example. Um, we would all shoot the shit with each other, you know. That's what got people to understand. It's like it literally, and this, this is one thing I'm going to say, that's one of the programs, and I can't say other program like that. The closest that has come is probably Marseille, where um, there's no egos, right? People literally treat each other like kin, like blood. Yeah, it's a, it's a really you know, tight knit family, and, and you don't see that. Everybody talks yeah. about oh, it's a family and this, this, and that, and blah blah. But then what? Behind behind your back, they're talking shit and all this crap. In Hall, if people truly care, you yeah. know, and you see it by actions, right? Like little things, what people would do for you. Um, yeah. for example, even like Coach uh, Coach Ziggy, who now is the AD, especially at that time, his first year, like he came and picked me up from a from from a national team tournament just to make sure I made practice for the for for the playoffs or Germany, I believe it was. Like little things like that, where it's like he doesn't have to do that, you know. And to be honest, somebody could probably step in and coach the receivers for me that day. But he's like, "No, I'm gonna go pick you up two hours and drive you, you know, in his fancy car, of course." Yeah, yeah. He he, <laughs> he let me he let me drive that one time. He said, uh, "He said, all right, when you get around this corner, I said, put put some gas on it." So I did it. I was like, I was so scared. So I just hit I hit the gas a little bit. He said, "What was that?" I said. I hit the gas. He's like, no, you didn't hit the gas. Do it on this corner. <laughs> he said, take off like a roller coaster. Yeah, I love it. I mean, out here, it's just uh, – it's a really it, – the whole community is, is like a, is a family. From mm -hmm. the fans down to everybody, you, you get that community feel every time you step on the practice field. Um, and you can't – you can't be above it or below it. I would say it's just kind of like if you if you step out of that that zone, then you can see it. Mm -hmm. You can you you can really see when people are not invested in that whole unicorn way type thing. I mean, and I saw it. I saw it actually the next year when I went to Munich because um, of work and I was coaching in Munich. The first game we had was against you guys at our house, and literally everybody ran up to me. Saying hi to me, hugging me, yeah. grab me, pick me up, like Mo, um, your guys are center, and I'm like, get away from me because you know I'm little. <laughs> um, you know, uh, Gary, number twenty-two, doing his weird stuff to me. I'm not gonna say it on air, but he does get touchy, touchy. He just and had I'm a baby. Like, but that's what showed me like the real, right? It's like you got me now on another team, but you guys still treated me like one of your own. That's sure. what was very surprising for me because I never had that before. And I even said last time when I, when I left Algo and I went to Kiel, for the most part, a lot of people on that program hated me because I left. I was a traitor in their eyes. And I'm yeah. going to say I don't care, you know. And that's what's interesting. Like, another thing, I mean, I can mention still people now from this day, from Kiel, they actually will ask me how's everything going. You good when they see me, they'll smile. But, like, that was kind of a, let's say, it was a little bit of a shock because in my head I had already been preconditioned to think what? It's probably going to be like this again, right? Yeah. But just having those guys and seeing them, even when they write me, like they'll text me and write me on Instagram, like, when are you coming? You have to come visit us. You know, maybe sometimes they're intoxicated texting me, but they'll do that too. Uh, and they're not going to name names, but they're like, oh, you have to come visit us. And you still haven't come with us. And when are you coming? And you, you need to leave Poland and France, you know? Oh, dude, that shows me, right? It shows me from the yeah. outside. Cause like you said, if you don't see it till you kind of leave or you step out of that bubble a little bit and you realize how it truly is. Like people yeah. care for each other. Exactly, and I got that. I got that too in Frankfurt, from like the team, like the coaches, the people that are still in Frankfurt that I know, is the same thing. But that that also goes to I also think the character of a person. I think if you um, you you get that welcoming from from leaving a team and stuff like that, it goes to how you treat you you treat the people as a team and how you're viewed as by the team and the people around it. That's true. So I mean, yeah. As far as the unicorns go, I mean. I think if I was to leave, everybody would be a little uh, 
a little sad, but I think if I saw him again in a different color jersey or just down the road, mm-hmm. it would be nothing but love. What do you what What do you think about doing right now? I mean, because like you essentially you went you now went into twenty eighteen. You guys won the Germ Bowl again. Of course, there was a there was a little bit the beginning of changing of the guard. Some guys started retiring already, like the Danny Washingtons, for example, and a few others. And you started bringing in some some new guys, transfers from other teams, up like my guy, um, um, Hoffels, Christian Hoffels from Algoy. Big Hoffels, my dog. He was supposed to come, technically, 2017, but he had a baby. So I'm yeah. not going to say anything, but if it wasn't for that baby, I would have had another dog on offense. Nah. But, you know, you had, like, now you started getting chain of the guard, new guys, also some young pups coming up from the U19 as well. Yeah, a lot of young pups. A lot of young you know? pups. So that's, like, the big thing where you kind of see is, like, each year kind of more of not having to reload, but now having to kind of fix the puzzle pieces and say, you know what, can we still make a run each year? Because you, you basically you guys did this again, 2018, won the shit, repeated, and now this last year, 2019, went again, but ended up faltering in the last game. against. I, th- I think it goes back to what you, what you guys talked about, um, about kind of building that foundation. They have a real strong foundation of, of guys and imports too, because I know everyone – you got to have imports, I guess, and um, just the just the guys that have been here for for so long together, um, just help solidify that foundation. I mean, none of us none of us have left since 2017, so I think it's kind of getting where you fit in here now. And um, as far as new guys and young guys, we gotta we gotta be more of a vocal leaders because everyone knows we do it on the field. It's just being more of a vocal leaders and show, hey, this is how the team is run. This is how we we came into it and know how it's know how it was run so we just got to keep that um I want to say that veteran leadership going towards a way that's just more feasible for the team to keep going and get higher and higher and better and better yeah and how much it hurts that was a jumbo word of shit right there that was just a bunch of jumbled bunch of shit <laughs> but, but I just sounded like mumbling and rambling <laughs> But just, just but back to the point, veteran leadership, man. That's what you need. You right. see the guys to come in and see, hey, this is how things are done here. This is what it is. Yeah. Ain't, no, much, ain't no, no in between. Don't worry. How much it hurts right now to be not on the field and, ah, we don't know if the season will play because we all know in yeah, Braunschweig it's a huge, huge generation change this year in Braunschweig. So I think a lot of teams... Having an eye like the big teams, of course, Trebuchard, Dresden, um, I don't know, Hildesheim probably, Frankfurt. A lot of teams have an eye on this trophy right now because the big generation change in Braunschweig. Um, how much that hurts because you say you guys not leaving, you're preparing. You, you are a team who goes out and say, we go win the German ball. You know, you're not hiding your expectation. You're like, hey. We are there. We go out to win. Yeah, it's kind of like, like, like kind of like, kind of like, kind of like. I mean, shoot, don't don't tell the police or the stad police. We still on the field. We getting we getting busy. <laughs> I mean, we're not on the game fields. Yeah, we we gotta just we gotta find ways to get better and better each day. So we're oh. we're on like little little side fields next to businesses and just in, in like parks and everywhere, just trying to get better and better. So I, I mean, mean, you gotta do what you gotta do. I mean, it's like. For real. Smart, especially in the situation, but it's not like it's a it's a true lockdown where it's like you guys can't do anything. Like, yeah, it, it's it's up to everybody just to be creative and find a way to stay in shape, right? Especially yeah. if you take it seriously. If you don't take it seriously, coaches will know day one when when we like when you guys hit the field and when we hit the field. No, off the oh, bat, yeah. all right. Was he was he slacking off or did he fucking try to do something? Because oh, yeah, for sure. Oh, you, me. You see. And I, I I mean I wonder how many guys are listening to us from here right now, and and they know this for a fact. Oh, I'm gonna test you day one. We're, we're about to run. Yeah. And I'm gonna motherfuck you and I'm gonna come at you to test you mentally and see what are you gonna do, you know? Because that's the thing, right? We're missing so much time. And if they tell us to start, we don't have time to baby you. The, ba- the baby shit is done. It's fucking done because, like, this is all that's adversity for everybody's on the same boat in this situation. Everyone's yeah. gonna face the same adversity. It comes down to, who are the two dogs? Who are, who are the guys ready to go who are hungry? And not the guys that are sitting at home being like, oh, you know, Corona, so I can't do shit. Hey, yep. day one with me on offense, all y'all about to get that real work. That's yeah, what, I, that's what I say, too. In 10 years, nobody asking anymore, oh, the 2020 season that don't practice five weeks. No, the, the games will be in the book. And if you play against 
Trebuchet, Frankfurt, Munich. You need to be ready to go. You need to be ready to go. So. Yeah, that's that's right. See, coach is speaking the truth. He said the game's gonna be in the book. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, the games will be in the book. So you got to get, listen to, if you listen to this podcast right now, the games will be in the book. So I know we getting ready on this side. Y'all better be getting ready on your side. That's all, that's what it is. Yeah. Coach is right. The games will be on the books. Yeah. And uh, how about you? Now your fourth season then with, uh, uh, with the unicorns. Um, just bring up a little example, Cristiano Ronaldo. He was going to Manchester United, his first station. He yeah. go to Real Madrid. Has no reason to leave Real Madrid because he is in his welcome place and feel welcome. But he take a new challenge of a lot of success to go to Juventus Turin. So let's say your Manchester was Frankfurt, your Real Madrid is uh, Schwebischal. What will be your Juventus Turin? Or you say, I'm fine, I'm stay, I'm I'm not gonna call you out of the contract, you know. No, you, you so can do it, man. Is probably, Newman is already calling me probably right now. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. but I like you, you wanna go like, oh I wanna get new challenges, or I mean like coach said, you're twenty-eight. What uh what's your twenty I'm I'm twenty seven now. Don't get it twisted. Huh? I'm 27 now. I'm still young. He's rounding up, you know. Oh, yeah, no, you can't round up. I'm still 27. <laughs> you can't uh, round up. Hey, don't round up. Stay, keep me young. But yeah. um, what's your plan for your for your playing career? For, for my Juventus. Um, shoot, man, I couldn't I couldn't tell you that. I mean, it's been a, between me and my family. It's been a lot of talk about that. About hey, what do you what what do you want to do? We know you still want to play, and big thing for them was. Because uh, people don't know, after I I went through the 2015 draft, the combine, all that stuff, because I went to the regional combine, did all that, they um, – I took two weeks straight of job interviews. Okay. So I, I was in a suit and tie for two weeks straight, Monday through Friday, one to two, to maybe three job interviews a week. And I got calls back. I got offered. I got just some some money that was pretty good that I left on the table. It was good jobs? Yeah, great jobs, marketing, PR, stuff like okay. that. But I told them, I said, I can't do this. There's just one day after that, I was like, I just can't. It's not for me. I still, I'm young. I still have a lot of play left in me. I don't right. know where it's going to be, but, and they said, we'll support you in whatever you do. Um, so, I mean, I did everything I could from different leagues that were popping up the tryouts. And now, uh, I mean, being playing for the last five years still, I don't know what, what the next step is. I know you all, Melee, you always talk about you got to plant your seeds here and there and do that. And I've, I've been doing I've been praying. I've been looking at things. And but as far as for me and my family, which I'm going to start adding you into it too for sure, um, about moving forward, it's just, like I told you guys yesterday, it's just day by day for me. I don't really know. Um, I know right now everything is uncertain whether we play or whether we don't. But moving forward for, like, 2021, if that were to happen, if there's a season, and I don't know. I mean, like Melee said, you hit me with the right the right food contract. I mean, <laughs> you hit me with the right amount of food. And the, and you, know what? You, you, you also mentioned yesterday about probably coaching something. You like Europe so much that you say, hey, I, I, I like to stay in Europe, or you like a guy. Yeah. I mean, I don't know why I go back to the states? For me, well, for me, um, I, I love being around family. I'm a big family guy, so I miss my family a lot. Um, I miss my nieces and nephews growing up and all that, mm -hmm. and just being around family and family time. But I could see myself doing something in Europe um, with football and helping, like I said before, grow the game and just traveling around and helping guys just get better at their craft and. Whatever they wanted to learn, I would just just give it to them as much as they as much as they wanted, just to help out. So I mean, coaching, I've I've done camps, I've done all this stuff. So I mean, we'll see about coaching. I'm not sure. I mean, and the other thing you have is you have that experience working at um, was it one of the franchise places, Velocity? Oh yeah, Velocity Velocity Sports Performance in Norwood. Yeah, Norwood. Present, baby. 
right? So like <laughs> you kind of have that aspect where you can kind of bring that out here in Europe because we all know also Poland a little bit and we're going to get into that next week with one of my buddies who's one of the top strength coaches in Poland um, on Monday. But the performance aspect of it is one thing where a lot of imports, for example, like yourself, I did that and been doing that, can also dial into at the same time and kind of saying, okay, I can play up to a certain point during that time, maybe kind of help out some guys and then kind of maybe develop something, you know, you don't per se have to open up your own facility right now off the bat because it does cost money to kind of have like camps, clinics, because this is a thing, right? The sport is getting bigger. We have guys that are trying to go division one, right? And one, one of my biggest friends and your biggest friends, I believe you play with them too, right? Brandon Collier. Yeah, big guy. Big, he's BC, yep. He'll be on next week with us as well, talking about his whole deal and how, how we work together and how this is going. Um, but that's also kind of a massive possibility because it's now becoming like it is in the States where parents kind of invest in their kids for the most part. Some of them push them too much. I don't want to talk about that whole aspect. But they invest money to get their kids proper training, go to camps, you know, to get them prepared for that next level. If it is trying to push them to go D1, but you, there is now a, what do you call it, a platform to do that out here in Europe because that's where the sport is now going. Where kids are making the jump, especially in the last three, four years, like the numbers of guys going to the States, high school, D1, now with the NFL pathway program. Um, with the CFL, for example, right now that we're working on as well, like it's it's there. It just depends somebody who wants to take it and do it the right way, especially with you know a name like yourself. Yeah, for sure. There's a bunch of avenues for that. I, there's been possibilities that I definitely have seen other guys try to take and do. And like Brandon, like you said, he's doing a great job with PPI and um, Emmanuel with uh, Kings of Europe. So I mean, and in, in your Europe's elite, but um. Funny thing is, I was with all that from day one. Right. In, in Frankfurt. Wait, when, Bre when Brendan had the little camps on the Army base. Right. So I was there day one, and we got paid Popeyes. I'll never forget that. He said, you guys want to come help out this little camp I'm doing? I said, yeah, we'll be getting paid. He said, I'll get you guys some Popeyes. <laughs> also, it's free food. You hey, you're the one that said it, right? Hey, I did it. I did it. I did it. If there's food coming... Yep. Hey, you what, I, I learned cooking, I learned cooking, and I feed you. <laughs> All right. There you go. That's easy. I take cooking classes because uh, he just slipped me a paper and something happened in the kitchen. I'm not going to say. But, uh, um, <laughs> no, um, you know, and that's one thing you're going to figure out. I mean, the other aspect that I kind of look at is now that you're kind of getting towards a possibly the end of your career, like closer, let's say, because yeah. you've got to look at your future, family, all that stuff, what is going on. Um, and this is one big thing where I always look at. And there's not only you, there's guys like Rory Johnson, for example, with the Berlin Rebels. There's like Jamal White with, um, he was forming with the Rebels. Now he's with um, the New Yorker Lions. And I'm going to have both of them on at the same time next week as well. One of the big things that sounds to me when I talk about top dogs, like ballers. And when I mean ballers, it doesn't only mean like on the field, it's off the field, your mentality, like that dog. That's something that you don't really see out here in Europe. And everybody yeah. brings up kind of the excuses and the bullshit. I'm going to say it's straight bullshit. We're like, oh, but it's not like states in the football and we got to be friends when we play with each other. Um, shit, you should hear some of the stuff that, that my kid um, who plays at Rhode Island, uh, Dimitri, who will also be on next week. I mean, he, he's German. He was yeah. raised in Munich. He plays at URI, you know. And the stuff he tells me, what he wants to do to people – on the field, you're like, um, he should get arrested. <laughs> but that's, that's it's a, but yeah, it's a it's a physical game, man. It's a it's a physical, dirty game. It's a like, savage you game. To, you have to be. You have to have that mentality because if you don't, exactly. you get, one, you're gonna get hurt, or two, you're gonna be sitting on the sideline pouting because you're not playing. Right. And and, and it also comes down. To. It also comes down to the to, to the chirpness too. Like this game is not a quiet game. Oh no, it's not, not a game all. to be quiet, right? Hey, people no. talk shit. They talk crap. Of course, there's a difference between being what? Between being um, saying some really fucked up shit and yeah. there's a way of just talking shit. And just and talking American. trash, yeah. Huh? So, yeah, there's, there's a difference between talking about somebody's mama than, right. than really getting in there. Oh, you think you're going to cover me? All right, watch this. Yeah. You know and, a guy like that? 
Do I am I a guy like that? He laughs. He laughs and giggles. Yeah. I'll be I'll, I'll be laughing, singing in routes. Yeah. I, I I during practice I have gummy bears in my jock strap just yeah. in case I get. You asking me if I want gummy bears? <laughs> we, you know, I, I'm from Dresden, and we we play with the juniors against like junior Berlin teams like Berlin Sanderbergs or whatever. They're always motherfucking us on Turkish. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell is going on? Like that I don't know what you're saying. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what you're saying. You don't need to speak anymore. I mean, I mean, what was it? When I went to Munich, I know uh, me and Coach Holly were coming after you. You know, no, you wasn't, bro. No, you wasn't. I said I, you was trying to, but what did I do? I was, I was laughing. I was giggling the whole time. Nicely, and I, what I say, I think it's I was like Butterfingers or some shit like that. And then you return the kickoff return. It's the only kickoff return I gave up that year, but I was pissed. But then you, so and then, well, I think I said something to you, and you turn to me, and you're like, I love you. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, you bastard. No, you can't. If you if you get in my head, then you you, you should be my uh, my doctor or something. Because uh-huh. it, you it's tough to get in my head and make and make me get out of my game, out of my rhythm. Oh, with other guys, it's easy to do. There's a oh, lot of guys. Yeah. It's so I, easy. I know guys you can just blink at them and they'll freak out. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. But that's it come from just having that mentality, like you said. Like I talked to Rory actually uh, this past week. That's my guy, my dog. Um, yeah, that's a that's a guy that every like he played with Patrick Willis and that that Ole Miss defense back in the day. If you're not a dog, yeah, if you don't have a dog mentality playing with at that level with them, you're not gonna cut it. So and he brought that out here. Now he's getting a little older. We we talked about that. I, I love you, big dog, but you know you're getting a little older. So you see him sometimes. He, but he'll admit it himself. Man, I've been taking a little place off here and there. <laughs> but he's, he's, he's old with age. He's with age. That's true. But, I mean, that's that's the guy that, too, like, and Jamal, too, they they just bring the, they bring the heat. I mean, and we noticed that. Like, year. Gomez, 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 he brings the heat. Yeah. Every Anchor. game. They they just bring it every Both single brothers game. and people talk shit, and they're like, they're dirty. And it's like, I mean. Hey, they, I mean, they, fine. yeah, they, they, be, they be doing, they be tripping and stuff, but, hey. If if you get away with it, you get away with it. I'm not I'm not I'm not the ref, so I can't. I'm not the one. That's not my place. I'm just here playing the game. I'm not the referee. I'm not the coach. The coach and the referees are the ones that can hash that out. I just gotta watch out for his flying legs and stuff. <laughs> that's it. No, but it's one of the. I mean, the other thing I look at it too as a coach. I'm like, hey, if I had both silver brothers, right? Let's say oh. bring bring up guys like like Quaid, Quaid, Quaid that also played with you, for example, in in Hall. Silver. In Hall, Dresden as well. Um, Frankfurt came from what Utah State, I believe. Rory, yeah. Jamal. If I had all those guys on my defense, t- <laughs> yeah, I'd be like, hey, you, deal with it. Yeah, you you're know? not you, you're not you're not on the other side saying all that. It's uh because they're on they're on your side. Yeah, but those guys like guys like that 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 makes the league fun for guys like me, guys that are want to compete at a high high level. It makes that's the like game fun. Yeah, it's it, instead of instead of. Three guys on the defense in Europe doing that, it's all eleven. So you gotta you gotta have that mentality of, hey, this dude talking crazy. I gotta go, 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 go at him the entire game. It even happened in Dresden when I was uh who was it? I think his name is Tim, the safety number six. Him Oh yeah. yeah. Him and, and one of their little outside linebackers. Two, I got. I was running something, and I didn't wasn't paying attention. I got waxed by the outside linebacker, and they both uh-huh. got. I was like, "Yeah, bring that again. Keep that same energy next play." And they, they just laugh, having fun. Like I love that. That bringing that energy to the game, getting smacked, and talking trash, and getting back up and smacking him. It's man, if you if you can't do that, this game ain't for you. And especially out here in Europe, where we're, we're what, are we, what are we trying to do? We're trying to build the game, right? And if we have all these guys want to come over and play here also as an alternative or a sort of a stepping stone to get back to the states for example let's say the kids out here understanding hey like to be honest and a lot of these junior kids out here they get babied by their coaches too where they don't know the expectation the true expectation of what it is playing the state so when they're thinking oh i can make the jump but you're practicing twice a week coach babies you doesn't make you come to practice doesn't discipline you and then you go to the states you're not gonna make it. Yeah, no. Like, one of the best. You may have the talent, but you won't make it. Yeah, one of the best things um, I think is what Brandon's doing is kind of putting those guys in that environment uh, early and often before they even get looked at by these 
uh, coaches and stuff was putting them in that environment around those type of guys where I, I've been watching some of those videos, keeping up with Brandon and stuff. And that's, to me, I, I haven't wrote them yet, but I want to write them and say, man, that's one of the, the best things I've ever seen. Cause I know for my life, I want to help out kids as much as possible. And for you to be doing that is awesome. And just seeing how they, how they interact over there and stuff like that, like that's big. And I think he's doing the right thing. Cause if they want to play football at a high level, getting them to college, that entire four years, five years, whatever they do there is going to be huge in their development in football and how it should be run. Because mm -hmm. it's, it's a, it literally, when people talk about, oh, I'm grinding, I'm grinding, that is a grind. No, no. Playing college football, no matter what level, if you take it serious, is a grind. And I, for any sport, basketball, baseball, if you take any sport serious enough and you do it at a college level where you got to add in classes and all that other stuff, it's a grind. So I think he's doing all those kids a wonderful favor by getting them in that atmosphere. And, may, hey, they may not play the NFL, but, hey, they can come back to the GFL and be top dogs and and be and just say, hey, this is what I did, and do the same thing that we're trying to do is just give back to the kids in the communities. And, and Co Coach Sebastian knows that, too. I mean, we talked about it with Frankie or Coach Frank Rosa from Ingolstadt uh, two days ago. Um, this also goes – along with coaches, for example, what it's like to coach in the States. Like, for example, with Coach Sebastian, I mean, your experience being at Ole Miss, starting off at Dresden, where, let's say, for the most part in Dresden, the structure is more related to how Hall runs it and a lot of more smaller colleges. But, like, at other places, compared to Ole Miss and schools where we've been at, completely different. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's what guys don't understand. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very different. And it's not um... – well, I guess out here you kind of you have that in a sense that you got to kind of do it on your own because there's not uh, what is it? There's no like sports with schools together. Mm -hmm. So I mean, you kind of got to do it on your own. But that's being in college. You literally have to get up, do things on your own. You have to be at practice. You have to be on time. So that's a big part of it, and just kind of growing up and maturing. So I think that's back to my point. That's going to help those guys out a, a, a lot. The guys that want to go play in college and. Um, trying to take that next step in playing football other than just kind of toiling around in GFL four and stuff like that and three or whatever. <laughs> yeah, that's of course something. How is it in the States when you are at college? Is this really like, I mean, how you get in touch with European football? Is this then so, okay, there is an opportunity to go also to Europe and play football? Or is it really not, if you don't know anybody, that you, you have yeah. no idea? Yeah, no idea. I had no idea. Uh, I mean, besides like Madden 2001 or whatever, when they had the European teams in there. That's right. Um, yeah. It. So, I mean, I played on one. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, I had no clue about it. And, my, and Nate Morris, he was the first guy to do it that I knew. And um, looking back, actually, on Facebook, I had a few, a few coaches reach out uh, before I, I graduated. I really didn't pay attention. Then I was like, "What the heck is this guy? Is this semi pro somewhere?" I didn't really know. He is that weird. You open up your Facebook account, have a message from a guy who is like nine thousand miles away. Hey, you yeah. want to play football in Europe? Exactly. I didn't. I didn't even look at him. I just looked at the names. Like, I don't know who this is. And yeah. then, uh, and then uh, my buddy Nate, he went out there in uh, Das Cheese. He went out to Swabish Hall and played. And me and my pops, because we're close, we watched. Uh, we watched him play a couple of times. We realized it was pretty cool. He's still playing, but it didn't really, the level didn't look still like as good as it is now, I would say. So mm -hmm. it was just almost like, ah, oh, yeah, he's out there playing. And then when he contacted me about the Frankfurt thing and I was still kind of jumping around trying to find what to do with football, I just said, man, that's the next best option. He did it. I mean, I, that's my guy. I love Nate with all my heart. I, I trust him. So um, I just put my faith in him and what he said, and the rest is kind of history with that coming out to Europe. But you don't know. You just – Back home, it's kind of like some guys say, I am just want to play in the league. Like I, I got a bunch of friends that could probably come out here and be ballers. Mm -hmm. um, but they just so caught up. And if I'm not playing back home, I don't want to do it. Okay. Yeah. Even, even, even when I tell them and they see the stuff and it's like, man, I just, no, just, I'm not trying to do it. Good but for yeah, you. you know. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Seriously. It's what it is. It's, it's also a life decision, you know. You're 9,000, 12,000 miles, depends where you are in the States, away yep. from home. You know, it's also a, 
decision you you need to want to make, not someone exactly. to you into it. Because exactly. that, that never work out when you have a coach and you already have an interview with a player and you really like, let's go, come, we try yeah. this. This is always like, uh, don't feel, don't feel good. No, definitely not. And my parents, they were stationed in Italy, actually in the Air Force. So they were, they lived here for a while. They, my oldest sister was born actually in, what's that base? Wiesbaden. She was born uh, on the base in Wiesbaden. So they, they had like some, they already been in Europe for a little bit. And they they kind of knew a little bit about it. So it was definitely cool. I think it also helps you in your situation because you also have that, um, that family support where every year, what, your parents come out at least twice a year, something like that? For the yeah, kids. They, yeah they've, they've come out twice a year. Um, my sister got married, so they didn't come, I think they came out once a couple of years. And then my little sister's getting married next year, so they're not sure about possibly, you know, they got to help out the family with all that okay. marriage stuff. But, I mean, yeah, they, I mean, if we go to the German Bowl, that was their thing. So that's a big for me, too, is, People always say, what's your why? And I really haven't really delved into that about what my why was. My coach told me about that after I started um, trying to look into the NFL stuff. He said, you got to have a why, man. You can't just go out there and be playing. So I think my why is just my family. And people say, what about it? And I just said, man, I don't know. It's just my family. I just like, love seeing them happy. I love seeing them because when, when I do good things, they get, they get excited for it and they're happy about it. So I, mean, I just want to make my family proud. And, and you have that support. I mean, at least for you, I kind of know you're, you're a family guy. You kind of need that. I mean, we're close, too, because we talk a lot um, yep. on a personal basis. But you're that type of guy where, let's say, you, you need, like, your, your network around you, your people, you know, and that's what keeps you positive, also playing at a high level. Because we know this, right? Like, if there's shit going off, like, on the sides, um, it's kind of it, – I'm that type of, that, type, that type of person. If I'm, not, if I'm not in a positive environment around good people, it's going to bring me down. Yeah, for sure. And at, and at least for you, you could at least continue to play at a high level because you have people around you, your family's there for you because you know, like, they're there, plain and simple. It's that support. Yeah, hands down. I mean, that's, that's like you said, that's huge just to have people around you, coaches, players, families, uh, fans, even just, just, I mean, it's tough being away from my family and not having that support that close. But, I mean, that's why they've been in FaceTime and all that. So it's easy just to be in touch. But, I mean, having you and – um guys just you can just reach out to and at a moment and just sit there and talk about whatever it really helps out a lot I mean because like you said being a positive guy you need that you just you just need that you need to have that in your life if not I mean for anybody you just need to have a, be a positive outlook on life because I mean you only got one to live what you gonna do with it <laughs> what you gonna do with it I mean us, I'm not gonna be in your grave you're not gonna be in mine Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and especially in this situation with the whole corona deal where everybody's trying to find a way to stay also stay positive because you see a lot of people kind of like low-key going a little crazy and get sad sheep, and man all it's all, all sheep I, I think huh? everybody's sheep i'm gonna say it loud in the mic everybody are sheep <laughs> are sheep <laughs> sheep they just fall in the herd like what well, my biggest thing was everybody was falling herd from that from the instance it even came up with all that toilet paper talk. Oh, like, wow. That's what I said. I said, if you told everybody coronavirus or whatever it is, whatever it is that's on right now, if you told everybody go buy cigarettes, it'll cure it, the shelf would be empty from cigarettes. Mm -hmm. It's just, I don't know, man. I, coronavirus and that. I don't want to talk about it because that should get me on a whole other tangent. <laughs> no, but that's, I mean, it's one of those things where it's 100% true. Um, our... Is like Jordan Newman and the other coaches, are they are they're trying to do something to kind of keep you guys, let's say, upbeat, positive, team oh, yeah. offense yeah. meeting. I saw so, like you guys posted some deal. It's like like little Jeopardy night. We're actually having that. Yeah. I mean, we have meetings too with our offensive defensive players two or three times a week and now also team meetings, for example. Yeah, we, we haven't done any like uh, football stuff yet. We're just trying to figure out what's, what the next step is. But we're definitely – we've been on Zoom. We've been having like little team game nights and stuff. So that, that's cool. And it's, it's awesome to see all the guys that you haven't seen in person yet, mm -hmm. just to see them and talk a little trash to them during the game and stuff like that. So, yeah. so it's fun. Um, but yeah, they're, uh, Coach Newman's doing a good job of trying to keep everybody upbeat and on the same page because he knows at any time, if this thing goes back to normal like that, we got to be ready to hit the ground running. Exactly. Well, what, what type of games are you guys playing right now? Any fun games? Is it Jeopardy or what is it? We played Jeopardy and we played. Uh, 
I don't know the names of them. We just play games. <laughs> it's like it's like those games you see on TV, like pick the uh, Jeopardy, and then what's the other one we had? Is he still doing that game that he had imports to where it was like imports and um, – Oh, Guess the States. Where it's like the, the U.S. The, oh, yeah. yeah. No, he, he does that when we're in person. He hasn't done that yet on the uh, on the Zoom, but – But he still does it, right? Part of like team building? Oh, yeah, team building. That's hilarious. That's I'm pretty good at it, though. I'm pretty good at it. I'm not going to lie. I can tell you where all the little countries are in Europe. I don't remember. What, what was your country back then, 2017? Do you remember? Shoot, I don't know. But last year, they hit me, tried to hit me with some hard ones. Croatia yeah. and stuff like that. I was like, <laughs> yeah, right here, right here, right here. I'm pretty good at my geography. I'm pretty smart, man. People don't, people don't think that. People are like, oh, Roby's he's goofy, this and that. Da, da, da. The people that know me, that really know me, they know what I'm about. So that's why right. I'm not even worried about it. Think, think about what you can think about me. Right. Good. But yeah, oh, we, we do a lot of team building stuff. Which I, that's why I like about that's why it's so tight knit. I think too because we just do a lot of stuff. Like you know, in seventeen we had the barbecue. Yeah, they do that every year. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, it's just a great, great environment to be in. Actually, just to so Hall does a lot of good things, man. <laughs> they just so, do a lot of good uh, things. It's the barbecues, the little mini camps too, like on bye week yeah. that he does too on like Fridays and Saturdays. Yeah, like, just to keep everybody together and on the same page. Yeah, and then you just from that you just build bonds like even after the games when everybody's out at the bar or in mm -hmm. nightlife everyone's just having fun yeah just having fun just doing doing things as you would do with your brothers it's just fun right all right man well we appreciate having you especially on this on this fire talk this holiday day since you know you're a busy man shoot i'm you the busiest no, but you, you probably got to work out today or do something but we appreciate having you um of course we'll, we'll stay in touch we'll talk but thanks again man yeah, definitely. Thank you guys for real. Love you guys. Thank you for all that. Stay blessed. Stay happy. Stay healthy. Yeah. Always. I love you. And uh, for everyone else for next week, we got some big time um, callers coming up. Um, my boy already mentioned them. Michael, big time strength coach in Poland for some of the top soccer teams out there, soccer, basketball. He is funny too because he likes to drink sometimes. No. Nah. Um, and then we'll have Tony Poller on. He'll talk about PPI. Um, we'll also have one of the top receivers from Poland, Mazan, Jacob Mazan. He's a big fan of you, Roby. He remembers all your cut-ups when I was in Poland. He oh, played for real? Me, and he's now with the Roll Claw Panthers. Um, that was a big move. It sent shockwaves all throughout Poland. It was in the media, newspapers, all that crap. But we, we got like a lot that. of yeah. yeah, he likes you. I think he follows you. Oh, for real? Tell him, what's his name? Tell him I got I to gotta get in touch with him so we can start working on some receiver stuff. Uh, he's a white boy. That's fine. As I, I know a lot of dudes that can get after it, no matter what color, brown, white, yellow, red. <laughs> they can get after it. All right, man. Have a good one. God bless, and I love you, okay? Definitely. Love you. Love you. All right, coach. I'll see you. All right. Bye-bye. Ciao.